This video is continuing right where the previous video left off. We are still in part 020 underscore file read underscore find dot m. All files in this video series are always going to be linked in the video description. In this video, we're going to be talking about the find function as well as logical arrays. These are going to be useful for locating values within a vector or a matrix that have certain properties. So here's the first example, control enter to run it. I'm going to scroll back up in my command window. So I've got this vector here with some ones, twos, and threes in it. I'm going to display it vertically. And then I'm going to create a new variable named logical array. And I'm going to put into that variable the result of v equals equals one. Now when I display this out, what I get is a bunch of ones and zeros. And it says logical array right here. Now this variable is a vector. It contains ones and zeros. If I multiply this vector by two, suddenly it's full of twos and zeros. If I add one to it, it's full of ones and twos. I can treat it as if it were a numeric array, but it's actually got a little bit of a special representation, and it's this logical array representation. It's using ones and zeros to represent true and false, or you can think of it as match and no match. So where the values in V are equal to one, there will be a one. Where the values are not equal to one, there will be a zero. Scrolling down in my command window, I have this table right here of the original values and the results. When I display out the logical array in a table, it doesn't display ones and zeros, it displays trues and falses, which is what is represented by the ones and zeros. All the code I'm presenting in this video is gonna work perfectly in Octave, except for the table stuff, just that. Everything else works exactly the same in Octave as it does in MATLAB. All right, I can use the find function on the v double equals one, or other comparisons that we will see to get the positions or indexes where it is true that V is equivalent to one. So scrolling on down, here are the positions, the indexes where V equals one. So we can see one, four, and six. The first, fourth, and sixth values here are ones. And then further, I can take those indexes, that vector, and I can use it to index into the vector V to grab out copies of those original values. Now that's a little bit silly here because I was only looking for ones, so I'm only getting ones, of course. But there are other logical comparisons that we can do. We don't have to just look for equivalence. We could look for greater than. So where are the values in V greater than one? Let's run that. And if I scroll up in the command window, we see I get a different logical array. My table looks very different. I didn't get different results down here because then I'd also have to change this to a greater than, but let's just go ahead and do that. Run it again. All right, so now there's a lot more values that are greater than one and I get all of the twos and threes. Continuing on down. And there's all kinds of comparisons that we could make. So we can do greater than, we can do greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, or not equal to. Important little notes here, the not equal to is with a tilde and you cannot put a space between greater than and equal, less than or equal, tilde equal, or even the double equals that we had before. You can't put a space in here and expect it to work. The double equals, it's important to say, is very different from the single equals. The single equals is put the information from the right side into the variable on the left side. The double equals is a comparison that is going to result in true or false values. Same with these other comparisons as well. These all result in true or false values, depending on the relationship. And I put twos in here for no particular reason. Could compare to one, two, three, whatever number you want. Continuing down, let's check out another example. Control enter. All right, here's my example vector this time. Got a variety of different values in it. And I'm gonna find in that new vector, where are the values that are less than or equal to one? And I'm gonna get a vector of those positions. So we can see here are the locations where V has values less than or equal to one. It does happen to be the same positions as equal to one in the previous example, but that's just coincidence. Continuing down. And then into that new vector, in the parentheses right after that variable name, I'm going to put the indexes variable and I'm gonna extract out the first, fourth, and sixth values. And that's gonna give me one zero and negative 99. So I can get access to the specific values of that information as well as their positions. I'm gonna repeat this idea of distinguishing between where information is located and the information itself. And sometimes that can be confusing because they're both going to be numeric values frequently. Continuing down, I'm gonna widen my screen, run this section, more with indexes. 
All right, so I've got two vectors here. I've got v and x, and v just has a variety of arbitrary numbers in it, and x has negative numbers in increasing order. But again, the values themselves could just be random. It doesn't really matter. And what I'm going to try and do is find a couple things. I want to know what's the biggest value in v, where is it located, and what is the corresponding value in the other vector. So first off, to find the largest value and where it's located, I create two different variables. I can name them whatever I want, but I've named them these names here. In square brackets, separated by a comma, and I set it equal to the result of the max of that vector. And when I display it out, I get the maximum value, the number 9 there, and the position in that second variable, which I've named which col for which column. So the column of that maximum is the number 5. And then to figure out my corresponding value in x, I simply say x parentheses which column. So x, in this case, at position 5, and then I put that result in here and display it out, and it's negative 5. And then I also do it all in one step. I say, okay, from x, at the position where v is equivalent to the maximum value in v, what is the value in x? Or if we like from the inside out, what is the maximum value in v? find the values that match that maximum value in the vector v, and then at those positions or where it's true that there is a match, give me the values in x, and I get the negative 5. So it works the same way as the code above. You can think of these two vectors as two streets. And on one street, v street, we have houses, and in the first house lives number 2, and in the second house lives number 6, and so on. And then parallel to that street is street x, and the first house in street x lives negative 1, and then the second house lives negative 2, and so on. So another way of phrasing this question is, let's find the maximum value living in a house on v street, but go one street over and see who lives in that house, in this case the negative 5 house. Now when I scroll down here, this next example is going to be mostly the same thing, but not quite. I'm going to look for the minimum value, and we're going to find another difference as well. I'm going to run this section, control enter. So I use min right here to get both the minimum value, which is 2, right there, in v, and also the position of it. Well, it's at position 1. Great. And then I index into x, so I say x parentheses and then that column value of 1 to get the corresponding value in x, which is this negative 1 right here. Great, there it is. However, a difference here is that there's two copies of the minimum value. There's a number 2 right here and another number 2 at the very end. The minimum function does not capture both of them, which in some situations is fine. However, if instead we say x parentheses v equals equals min v, then we actually get both of those corresponding values. So we get in x all of the values that correspond to where v is equivalent to the minimum value in v. And so we get both the equivalent values to a negative 7, 2, and negative 1. And then I didn't know where to put this last bit, so I'm just going to tack it on right here. How to save and load the workspace. And this also works exactly as given here in Octave as well as in MATLAB. So all we got to do is use the save command and then a blank space and then some file name. And I just called it saved work. I'm going to hit control enter. And if you're watching carefully, you may have noticed in the current folder window over here, it creates this new file, savedwork.mat. The .mat extension is added automatically, and this file contains a copy of all the values from my workspace. So if I clear off the workspace, control enter, great, it's all gone now, and I try to display out those vectors that I had, v and x, the originals and the buddies, well, it says unrecognized, there's no such thing. I don't know what v is because it's not in the workspace. But scrolling down slightly, if I just load saved work, I don't even need to say .mat, I just say load and then the file name, and then I try and display it out, it's going to work great. All right, and my window's narrow, so you can't see it very well, but here's uh, x and v displayed out over there, and my workspace has been restored. So that could be useful if you ever need to save all the work that you've generated into a file. You can do that with save to save the information, and load to load it back in to the workspace. And that's all for this video.